title of my message is Why Marriages Fail. Why Marriages Fail. I know most of you are single, but we need to prepare you now so that, um, because the real issues with marriage is not really marriage. Most times it's the foundation. This beautiful building you are seeing here, the most important part of it was the foundation. If the foundation is not right, it doesn't matter what other design they want to put on top. Somebody getting what I'm saying? Why marriages fail. I'll run through about seven things if I have the time tonight. The first one. Marriages fail because people don't like themselves. People don't what? Like themselves. What I mean is self-love. You cannot give what you do not what? Have. You must first love yourself. I'm not talking about selfishness. But there is a healthy self-love you need to have. You need to, see, do you know why some people are desperate to marry? They don't like themselves. They're trying to run into somebody else's life. <laughs> you must first like yourself. Listen, it is who you are that will determine the kind of marriage you will have. You can't really marry above your knowledge that you have or the person that you are. You must first love yourself. How much do you love your life now? Marriage is not a rescue mission from your own life. Do, I mean, do you love yourself? Do you love your life? Look, your single years is not a time for you. You're not just waiting to get married. That's not what your single years are for. And that's what a lot of single people are doing. Their single years is just a time they are waiting. They are marking time to get married. That's not what it's about. Your single years is practice time. Your single years is preparation time. Your single years is packaging time. You are preparing yourself for life. You are preparing yourself for destiny. See, you have a destiny. Let me tap your number say you have a destiny. Do you understand? There's something God wants to do. Marriage is not the destination. Marriage is only a vehicle to get you to the destination. Marriage itself is not the goal. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Marriage is not the goal. Many people are unhappy because in marriage because they set marriage as the goal and when they got there, they found out nothing is happening there. If you're not going somewhere, marriage itself is not a cure-all for all the problems of your life. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Marriage, I'm sorry to tell you, marriage won't solve all the problems of your life. It wasn't meant to. It wasn't created to do that. It's supposed to be a vehicle to take you to your destination. You're, so you already have a destiny in God. The, the altar is not the goal. To get married is not the goal. You must first love your life. Let's, let, let's just imagine, for, for example's sake, let's imagine there was no marriage anymore. Will you still be happy? Will you still be happy? I hope you know there is no marriage in heaven. I hope you know that. We're all going to bring our sisters. I was sitting very close to my wife, though. But. <laughs> so sometimes I call her my sister. She say, I'm not your sister. I say, you are my sister. I'm a man of God. You are my sister in the Lord. <laughs> Somebody get what I'm saying? Let's imagine there's no marriage. Let's just imagine now. Just picture it that there's no marriage. So are you saying you're not going to do anything with your life? What would you be doing with your life if there was no marriage? Love your life so much. Listen, it's important to where you're going. Love your life now so much. Live your life as if this is it. This is not rehearsal. You, the game has started. Life, has, life is on. So if you're not happy now, so why are you going to be happy in marriage? Who told you? In your mind, you think if I just marry, that guy will just, you know, he'll be talking to me every time. He will say the right things every time. You must be kidding. Somebody that was in traffic going to work for four hours or in traffic coming back for under four hours, you think when he gets home he's thinking about to say the right things to you? You see, this is why many people are unhappy in their marriages. They had false expectations. They had set unrealistic goals that once I get married, I know you are single people. Most of us have been married. We can, we can give you heads up. You know? A lot of single people think once you marry, you'll just be having sex morning, afternoon, night. That's what they think we do. And you know, you have watched so many movies. You see them breaking their plates. Break. Nobody's breaking plates, man. <laughs> we work so hard to buy those plates, man. 
Nobody's breaking anything. Nobody's in the mood for all that nonsense. Those things are acted. There's a cameraman there. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a microphone there. there, there it's acted. It's not real. Somebody gets what I'm saying? Because these are the things single people are watching and they're thinking this. And you know, all the movies, you need to understand, guys, movies are not created to mentor you. That's not their job. Their job is to entertain you and collect your money. So to be watching movies as if that's education, you're wasting your time. So you see all the movies, they just paint a romantic scene, love story, you know, Cinderella, uh, whatever, whatever. One guy is riding a white horse. He has six pack. <laughs> and that is the idea you are having. No. Marriage is not a cure-all. It's not going to, marriage wasn't designed to solve all your problems. You start solving your problems now by the knowledge of God. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Be happy now. People don't love themselves. That's why I see people want to enter relationships. I'm wondering, when people ask me some questions, I'm wondering, is it that you don't like yourself? Somebody will tell me, Pastor, there's this guy, he's always beating me, he's always insulting me, but he say he says he loves me. What should I do? And I'll ask, do you even like yourself? Because when you like yourself, there are some things you won't take from people. The reason why you are considering some things is because you don't yet love yourself. I'm not talking about selfishness. I'm talking about self-love. It's important that you must first love yourself. When you love yourself, there are some things you will not even accept. You just know it's unacceptable. Hallelujah. You need to understand this, guys. So the first thing, you need to love yourself. Love your life. Pursue your purpose. Why did God create you? What else? What are the things that will give you fulfillment? Marriage is not, the altar is not the goal. The goal is fulfillment. The goal is happiness. So you pursue your own happiness now. Be happy as a person. In fact, many, many single people think, if, I'm, if I meet the right person, I'll be happy. No, the right thinking is if I'm happy, I'm more likely to meet the right person. Did you understand that? Many people think if I meet the right person, I'm happy. No. If you are happy with yourself, you are more likely to meet the right person. Because you will get to the stage in your life where you realize you don't need a man. You don't need a... See, the only reason why you should leave singlehood is when marriage is going to be better than the singlehood. If, if being married is going to be worse than where you are now, then stay single. Stay single. Trust me, there are many married people praying to be single today. They want to be single. They're trying to come out of what they've entered into. You still have a chance to do it right. And I pray for you. You will do it right in the name of Jesus. So don't just say, oh, I just want to, uh, I'm tired of being single. No, don't, don't think like that. Your single years are crucial. Listen, there will be no other time that you'll have your whole life to yourself like this. There's no other time. From the day you marry, everything in your life is going to be split. Your time your money, your resources, your energy is going to be split. And guess what? It gets worse. When the children come, oh my God, when the children come, for the next 20 or so years, your life will never be the same. So are you seeing that this time you have is precious, you will never have it again. But you are trying to run away. There are things you are supposed to build now that you will never have time to build again. Somebody getting what I'm saying? You must love yourself. Hallelujah. Mm. <laughs> let, me, let me move. I'll explain something as we go on. So number two. On that reason why marriages fail is that people don't love each other. So a lot of people in relationships, they don't actually, they don't understand what love is. So they really do not actually love each other. What they love is marriage. Oh, there are a lot of people that love, they tell you I love you. It's not you they love. They love the idea of love. They love love. <laughs> Some people just love love. They love the idea of marriage. They love the idea of romance. It's not the individual they are married to that they love. People send me messages all the time. Pastor, everybody in my house, all my siblings married late. Me, I want to make sure I marry early. You see, when somebody has already said that, it shows that they have their own, a, they have a personal project of marrying early. So it's not about even the person they are marrying. 
It's about they have their goal. I don't know if you guys know what I'm saying. I have a book out there titled 25 Wrong Reasons People Enter a Relationship. This is one of it. Personal project, personal goal. I want to marry for the end of the year. So they are looking for a scapegoat <laughs> that will volunteer themselves for this project. So people like that end up marrying someone they don't even like. I'm telling you this, come on. There are a lot of married people that don't like each other. They like marriage. They like children. They don't like the individual that they have married. You can tell. You can tell they have no likeness for this person they married. Just the idea is what they like. They've already planned that I want to get married by 28. So if they meet you at 28 and a half, <laughs> no matter who you are, they're marrying you. And you will think they love you. <laughs> Praise God. They don't love you. Somebody told me, say, Pastor, there's this, this guy, I love him so much, but he seems he loves somebody else. But I love him so much, I give everything. I said, I, said, I, told, I told her, you don't love him. He said, no, Pastor, I love him. I said, you don't love him. I said, look, if you love someone and the person doesn't love you back and you are pressuring them, you don't love them, you love you. Because if you love them, you will respect their wishes. You want them to be happy. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. So to be saying somebody must marry you. Must marry you. Then you are just trying to use that person to satisfy something in your own life. It's not about the person. You don't really love the person. And they love relationships like this. Where someone is using another person just to satisfy their need. It's not really love. Hallelujah. When you love yourself, then you have to also love whoever you want to marry. You have to actually love the person, not just the idea of the person, not the image, not the gift. You know, some people think, when, when they see people on this stage, they, they actually love the image of the person on the stage. They don't love the person as a human being. They like it. They love his gift. Pastor Tyler, there was one woman of God, pastor's wife, during service, she came to sit down on the altar like this. They say, Mama, what's wrong? She says she wants to marry the pastor of this church. <laughs> they say, you're already married to the pastor. They said, they said, she said, no, that the one that preaches here is not the same one. <laughs> that the one that preaches here is very funny, very nice, very caring, very spiritual. Say, the one at home shouts at me. The one at home beats me. I get sure she sat down here that this is the one she wants to marry. <laughs> Some people think we preach at home. They think that's how I talk to my wife. That listen to me, my wife. I love you. Are we eating beans tonight? Put some pomo in that stew. Listen to me. They think that's what I'm doing. No, I don't preach at home. <laughs> I don't preach at home. <laughs> Hallelujah. Comedians don't crack joke all the day at home. Musicians don't sing to their wife. I just want to eat what you have. <laughs> that's not what they do is somebody get what I'm saying so do you love this individual or do you love the idea do you first love yourself when you love yourself there are certain terms and conditions you don't even play with you, do, you, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't see the Bible says two must be better than one if joining with somebody is going to make you worse then don't marry so love yourself enough to say I'm not going to put myself in this situation this guy is a liar. This, this girl is abusive. This whatever. Then don't leave. Don't go ahead. Don't, don't force it just because you are tired of being single. You shouldn't even be tired of being single if you are using your singleness well. Somebody getting what I'm saying? See, your singleness is your marketing period. See, you have to be the kind of person that once people meet you, once they meet you, they, they, I mean, their life should never remain the same. So don't, don't, don't be in a hurry. Some of you are just doing your best to live singleness. That's not what it's about. It's a season of your life that is very crucial to the destiny of your life. All the greats in the Bible, we saw how they lived when they were single. The Josephs, the, the Jesus, and go. They, they were already walking in purpose before they got married, or before they met, you know. So the, the, there's a life you're supposed to believe in. David, there are many of them. They were doing something with their single years. It is that thing you are doing that would see. Everybody has a list of what qualities they want in a spouse. Your future spouse too has a list of qualities they too want. So how many of the qualities have you developed? 
In every vacancy, they have a list of who they are looking for. How much of it are you building? You've never traveled before. Can you travel now? When you get married, you can't just up and go. Can you learn basic skills? Can you, can you cook? Can you clean? Can you do some things? Can you, can, can, I mean, have you built your spiritual capacity? Build it now. Because when you are married, <laughs> to pray will not be as easy. Because you must always seek somebody's consent. There's somebody else sharing your space, sharing your time, sharing your energy. Hallelujah. Number three. So number one, you must first love yourself. This should affect your terms and conditions. I tell ladies all the time, you must have certain terms and conditions before you even start a relationship with a guy. Basic terms and conditions. Women, you are more powerful than you know. Most times, the, the ladies, instead of you to control, I'm saying this because as a woman, this is what happens. A guy is like an, a, 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 a politician. He's giving you his um, manifesto. You are the one that will determine if you are going to vote this guy into office. Because when you vote this guy into office, the Bible expects that you will submit to this guy. Women are always shouting, no, we don't want to submit. It's simple. You are the one that is picking the person you are submitting to. So pick the right kind of leader. That's all. Why, why are Nigerians trying to relocate? <laughs> because they like the leader in the other places. Is somebody get what I'm saying? Yeah, that's how it works. So you, you choose the right person. So there are basic terms and conditions. Let, let me drop some for you. If a guy is asking for your hand in marriage, one of the basic terms and conditions to discuss is sexual purity. Discuss sexual purity. If a guy is saying, hey, I love you, baby, and all these sweet things, tell him what are his plans when you guys start a relationship. Is he the kind of person that must have sex while you are dating or does he believe in honoring the Lord? And gentlemen, can I also advise you, because most ladies say the men can't wait. Today, can I challenge you? Be that kind of man that can wait. The devil is just setting you up. There's nothing like you can't wait. You will still wait. That issue, that issue of self-control. Eh? Can I just tell you now as a married pastor? Single guys, all the single men, can I hear an amen? Because I know men have a higher sexual uh, passion. I, women to like sex, don't get me wrong, but I know men usually have a higher one. Men have the ideology that you know, we can't wait. Maybe we're already going to marry. Let's just sleep together. Man, let me just help you right now. Let me just save your life. Start now to practice self-control. The reason is this. It's very simple. And ladies, this is important to you too. It's very simple. The game of self-control is not just for when you are single alone. It gets intensified when you are married. If you skip the test now, you are setting yourself up for a bigger failure in marriage. Every fornicator is an adulterer trainee. <laughs> See what you are doing to yourself. You are saying, I can't wait. I must have sex. Then you get married. Now that you are single, you are sleeping around. And the way the sex works, nobody takes six with one person. As you are sleeping around a single, everybody you date to sleep with them. So you have been sleeping around. Now, this is the problem. You are used to browsing different channels. Then you will get married. And you think you want to stay with one channel. You have already built a habit of eating buffet. <laughs> now you want to eat only moi moi <laughs> in marriage till you die. So the business of self-control, it doesn't end when you are single. It actually gets more intensified in marriage. If you don't practice keeping yourself now, and both of you honoring God now, you are setting each other up for big temptations and big failures when you are married because the temptations doesn't stop just because you say, I do. It doesn't, it doesn't change who you are. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So now is the time. So as a lady, one of the basic terms and conditions to discuss is sexual purity. The guy that says he can't wait, he's a setup. He's not going to also wait in marriage. Same thing. He's not going to wait. It's tougher to wait in marriage. And don't even start. 
See, it's easier to not drink a bottle of Coke when you've not opened it. It's easier. Once you say, let me just sip it. And you do shh. Throughout the day, you'll be going to that fridge and be taking Am I correct? Before the day is over, it has gone down. But if it was still sealed, not opened, it's easier to fight the temptation that way. So if you are here today, it's a challenge I need to give you now. Start walking. These are part of the terms you should discuss. Other basic terms and good conditions you should discuss as a lady, if a guy is trying to ask your hand in marriage, ask him for who are his mentors? Who are the people he's accountable to? Men in their nature are just a bit rough. We're made that way. Men are rougher. So generally, they have the tendency to be reckless. So as a lady, don't join with a guy that doesn't have under male figure in his life that he can emulate, that can inspire him. The way women do better with sitting and listening, men do better with watching. Men learn better from watching another role model. They do better from watching another person that inspires them. So if a guy is coming to ask your hand in marriage, coming to say I'm interested in you, one of the terms and conditions must be there must be somebody over your life that you submit to, that I can talk to, that I can report you to, to give you safety. One of the first things I did with my wife, when once we started dating, was I took her to my mentors. I took her then to Reverend Sam Ademi, Reverend Victor Ademi, and Reverend Abba to Duwale. And I told her, these are my mentors. I introduced my mentors to her. I said, collect their numbers. Feel free to report me. Anytime you can't get to me. Anytime my head is touching. Feel free to report me. And she has done so a few times. <laughs> Praise God. One time in, a, in an animal um, park, or this preservation park where they put wild animals in their natural habitat, they brought in a young elephant and some rhinos, and they found out that that elephant was killing the rhinos. And that has never happened before. So they called in an expert. The expert examined everything. He said, it's very simple. Get an older elephant. That this young elephant has so much energy, he doesn't know what to do with the energy. He needs an older elephant to show it how to live. So they brought in an older elephant. The younger elephant submitted to the older elephant and all the killing stopped because the older elephant showed the younger elephant that we don't beat our wives. We don't do it. We don't, we don't kill rhinos. And it, the killing just stopped. Men do better when they have another figure, a stronger male figure in their lives showing them how marriage should be done. So what Pastor Conley did here today is very important. The younger guys need to emulate that. If they don't see those pictures, they have the tendency to be reckless. Number three. Are we number, is it number what am I in? Number four, yeah? Three. Anyone? Number next. <laughs> Marriages fail because people don't build themselves. People don't build themselves. Do you know everything that you are required to do in marriage is also what you are required to do as a Christian. It's not, see, this marriage thing is not as complicated as people make it. Everything you were supposed to be doing inside of the marriage is what you are supposed to be practicing for free as a Christian. The things that cause problems in marriage, unforgiveness, as a Christian, they've already asked you to forgive all those that offend you. If you have been practicing it in church as a normal Christian, then to forgive the person you claim you love should not be difficult if you have been practicing. So when last did you forgive somebody that offended you, your brother in church, someone in your office? You are, God has already told you as a single person, start forgiving. For instance, walking in love. God said love everybody. I remember the story of that man that was tired of his wife. They were having quarrels. He called pastor. said, pastor, I don't love this woman anymore. I'm not doing it again. Pastor said, the Bible said, husbands, love your wife. He said, she's not my wife. She has been staying in the next room. We've not been talking. She stays in the next room. Pastor said, the Bible said, love your neighbor. <laughs> he said, she's not my neighbor. We insult ourselves. She's my enemy. The Bible says, love your enemy. It's all there. If you have been practicing it, it will be easier to practice it in marriage because all the instructions are the same. Being patient, serving, 
That's why for me, I would never really be attracted to somebody that doesn't serve in church. I just think it's a big deal. I just think serving another person is crucial because that's what you do in marriage. You serve another person. So if you can't serve now that you're single, that you have all your time to yourself, why would you think you will serve when you're married? Serving. Serving another person. Serving someone for no reason. Serving someone and not expecting anything in return. So you can't do that freely in church. I could never have married someone that didn't serve in church. I could never. I won't even be attracted to the person. Because if your whole life is built around you, then you won't do well in marriage because marriage will be a shocker. Because marriage will not be about you at all. So be an usher now. That trains you to serve. You know, as an usher, you tell somebody to go this way, they go on that way. You are learning patience. <laughs> you are learning. You say, sit here and you come back here, it's not here again. You are learning. Because your children will be like that. Sometimes your husband will be like that. <laughs> Is somebody getting what I'm saying? It's training you. Build yourself. Build your financial capacity. Marriage is not a source of income. That's a rema for somebody here. You can't marry your way out of poverty. So you are targeting someone because you think they will solve all your financial problems. No. Do something now. Build your own financial capacity. Your ability to make money, to manage money. Build it now. I tell ladies all the time, please don't marry a man's potential. Marry his patterns. Everybody has potential. Since they gave back to me, they say Nigeria has potential. Since they gave back to me. If I was waiting for that, I wouldn't be here. So don't marry someone for your potentials. Check his patterns. What is he doing with his life? Oh, I want to marry you. And he's 38 years old. Great. From when you were 28 till 38, give account of your stewardship. What have you been doing with your life? I'm not saying he has to be rich. No, but we should be able to trace what he has built with his life so far. I'm saying this because there are many marriages today crashing under the issue of financial burden because somebody is not pulling their weight. Somebody doesn't want to work. Somebody always has dreams, but he's not doing anything practical about. How many of you have those kind of friends that have big dreams? Every day you meet them. They're saying, I'll buy three airplanes <laughs> to start an airline business. Do you know where they keep airplane? <laughs> no, but I'm going to buy three. Only you. Now, do, do you have Okada? Okada? <laughs> no. I can't start that small. I start big. My God is a big God. <laughs> Praise God. All right. So, so build yourself. All right, let me run through quickly. Number what? Number next. Marriages don't, want, don't work because people don't understand the differences between men and women. They don't, they, don't, they don't take time to understand differences. And this is a big deal, guys. If you are here and you are ever thinking of marrying, one of the things you must start doing now is learning the differences between a man and a woman. They are, we are just different. And the issue is this. We are so different, so we tend to love the way we are, not the way the other person wants when, when, when you say love your husband, love your wife, that's a very vague term. What does that mean? It's too vague. If I say love your husband, what does that mean? It's vague because you can be loving him the way he doesn't want to be loved. So you must break it down to what, how it relates to that person. We were created from scratch to be different. You will have a lot of ease in your marriage when you know how to relate with that person with understanding. That's what the Bible says in First Peter. It says, treat your wife according to knowledge, according to understanding. So men and women are different. If you are going to love your husband, love your wife, you must start learning about the differences. There's this book here I want to encourage everybody to get. It's called A to Z of Marriage. I and my wife wrote this book. Um, we addressed love in alphabetical order, A to Z, what, what it means. So I wrote to the women, coaching them about how to love men. My wife wrote to the men, coaching them how to love women. So I'll give you a few from it. A, I told men, A, if you're going to love a woman, A stands for attention. Women love attention. So you must master the art of giving them what? Attention. So you cannot, if you are dating someone, you cannot not have a special plan of visiting them or talking to them. Because in the world of men, men don't need to talk every day. No, if I, if I is my very good friend, but we don't talk until there's something to talk about. I don't just wake up and call him and check on him. No, men, 
Men don't do that. Men find that very awkward. Checking on me, eh? What you have? Any problem? You see, so because guys are like that, they want to treat women like that. So when I first started dating my wife, she had to tell me that, hey, you can't just, because we met this Monday and we plan to see next Monday, you can't just be silent all through the week till next Monday. And I'm saying, I'm keeping all my gist <laughs> till next Monday. That's when we agreed we're going to see. She said, no, you must check on me. Somebody get what I'm saying? Attention. Women like attention. So you must give them attention. If she walks into a place, you have to stop what you're doing and look at her. You can't just say, you're entering, you're entering. No. No attention. Hallelujah. She can't make her hair just coming. You didn't even notice. That's a capital offense. Attention. She's talking to you. You can't be on your phone. You have to keep the phone down and look at her when she's talking. Somebody get what I'm saying? Nobody will teach you these things, but these are things that will make things flow smoothly. A for attention. For the women, my wife coached them and said, one of the things a man needs is acceptance. Most women, when they meet a man, they're already sizing up all the things they are going to change about that man. Say, hmm, okay, his beard rough. I'm going to trim that one. <laughs> his teeth is not on straight. We're going to file it. She, in her mind, she has imagined all the things she's going to change about him. Say, he's dressing, it's too shabby. No, 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 no. All those things are great. And you can actually get those things done, but you must first give him acceptance. Men have the tendency, if you try to conf confront a man, he would fight you back. Even when he thinks you are right, but he's a warrior. He was created to fight. So you don't come in his line of fire and co correct him. Come by his side as an ally. Once you are beside him, hallelujah. Once you are by his side, once he knows you love him, once he knows you accept him for who he is, and you are now advising him as if he's both of you against the world, you can get him to do everything you want him to do. But if you come like you are part of the world attacking him, he's going to fight, have this stance against you. I get what I'm saying. Because most women make that mistake. You want to change something about him and he just comes right on. No. Tell him that you are so and so now. You are such a great person now. This is what you're going to achieve. I don't know how some people will see this, your dressing. Some people. <laughs> you. You love his dressing anyhow it is. So let him know. Look, any, if you want to wear slippers to this board meeting, I'm fine. I just think that some people there, they don't already like, they don't like you. So if you wear it, they would be using it against you. You see, that's, you have advice him. He'll go and change. <laughs> Accept that. That's A. Let me go to H. I'll just mention three of them. H is for, I told women that men need help. H is for help. The first place, the reason why God said he was going to make women was because he knew that men needed help. God made everything he made. He said it was good. Say he made stars, seas, fish. Say it was good, it was good, it was good. When he made man, for the first time, God looked at it and said it's not good for this man to be alone. God said, I'm going to make him what? A helper. So first thing, men need help. Most men are so one-track minded that every other thing around their life suffers when they are chasing one goal. So, a woman is great at multitasking because she can help him. So, when you see his weaknesses, your job is not to criticize him, help him. So, if, for those that are married, it's a simple thing. So, he drops his shoes anywhere he takes it off, help him. That's an area of weakness. He's not good at managing his money, help him. Because most times, the thing you are complaining about is actually what you are called to solve for him. So, instead of criticizing him, so he has mouth order brush for him. I'm joking. <laughs> but you are called to help him. For the H for women, we're telling the men what women like. H there is humor. Most men don't know, but women like men that make them laugh. Humor. Pastor Kole mentioned that today. Humor. So if you are going to marry a woman, one of the things you must learn to do is to make her laugh. In fact, you need to be seeing her laughter every time she laughs at like $1 million in your account. That will motivate men if you bring it in financial terms. <laughs> See every time she laughs or smiles. So it's okay to make a fool of yourself sometimes just to make her laugh. You don't have to be a comedian, but you must master the art of making a woman laugh. Somebody get what I'm saying? Make her laugh. 
Make a fool of yourself. It's okay. Hallelujah. There are so many scenarios. I don't want to mention them. I'll do R, the last one for under this book. R, I told the women that R for men is respect. Men like respect. They were created that way to, to have an ego. There, there's a negative part of the ego, but there's the positive part. So you don't want your husband or your man not to have an ego at all. There's a negative part of it. He doesn't need that one, but he needs some self-respect, some, some dignity. He was created that way because he's a potential head of your home. Are you here, somebody? So you must always speak to him with respect. You can disagree with his point, but always speak to him with respect. You will melt his heart. With it. There's a woman called Abigail in the Bible. I, I have a message titled, The Unforgettable Woman. I mean, David met that woman only once in his life. He, he, he never remained the same. Immediately, she lost her husband. He came to marry her. Her name was Abigail. She met David once, and she knelt down to speak to him, and she called him Lord 14 times in one, in one conversation. 14 times. David could never forget that. That woman was such an unforgettable woman. She married a fool and they still made something out of their life. Her husband's name was Nabal. Foolish. And she confirmed it that he's a fool, as his name is. But they were still great. And I'm sure it was that woman that was the secret behind their prosperity. Because she was still making dumb decisions by not giving David money. David came back to marry that woman because she was respectful. They said, Sarah called Abraham Lord. What are I trying to say? We're not saying you should not, see, that's why you must be careful of feminism movement. There's the positive one where you fight for real rights that women have. There's other people that are fighting things that have nothing to do with feminism. They are just, they are angry. Something else is offending them, so they are fighting other people. So be careful of those things. It's still okay to be respectful. The R for women, I, my wife told the men, is romance. If you're a guy, you must know how to be romantic. Most, most guys, you see, guys are rugged. We're not naturally romantic. But if you're going to be dating or marrying a woman, then you must learn romance. Every man needs to learn it because every woman likes it. What is romance? It's not, it's not complicated. Romance simply means doing the simple things in a special way. So the same simple things you are going to do, just try and make it special. Okay, she want, you want to buy her perfume, perfume. Don't just take her to the shop and say, point anyone you like. I have money. I'm going to pay. No. Don't do like that. Try and find out the kind of fragrances she likes. Then go and buy it. Then when you buy it, don't just bring it to her office or bring it somewhere and put it here and say, see, I bought perfume for you. See there. It's expensive. Oh, use it. <laughs> no. Wrap it. Hide it somewhere she will find it when you are not there. It's simple. You don't even need, <laughs> Hallelujah. You don't even need so much money. I'm just coaching the guys. You don't need so much money. Just put, do the simple things you were going to do in a special way. I remember one of the first gifts I bought my wife, one of the first gifts I bought my wife was a phone. So it was many years ago when Jason was still new. It wasn't a new, brand new phone. It wasn't a fairly used phone. It was an unfairly used phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know those phones that don't come with charger, don't come with anything, you buy the phone separate, you buy every other thing separate. <laughs> That's how it was. I didn't have money. I didn't have money, but I knew she needed a phone, and I wanted to get her a phone, but she, I, couldn't, I couldn't buy any new phone. I couldn't buy even a, a, a fairly used phone. It was a very unfairly used phone, <laughs> on a serious note. But that was what I could afford. But you see, I didn't just bring the phone and give it to her. No. You know what I did? I bought the phone. We went out. Um, she left to go and use the bathroom or something. I put my hand in her bag, brought out her phone, took out her SIM card, put in the new phone and put it back in a bag. And by the time we finished with the deal, we went to watch, um, go for a comedy show or something, in Muson Center or something. By the time I dropped her back in a hostel in New York, she was in a master's then, I go home. Her, that phone kept ringing in a bag. And people would tell her, is that not your phone? She said, no, I don't, that's not my phone ringtone. <laughs> and it kept ringing, and they said, it's from your bag. They said, it's not my phone. Until she picked it and found out that I had changed her phone. Now, you see, it was an unfairly phone, but she was so happy with the way I presented it, she didn't notice that it was an unfairly useful. Praise God. So, the, the simple point is, you know, you, the normal things you would do, but just do it in a special way. All right. Hallelujah. People ask me all the time. They say, Pastor, which kind of person should I marry? Very simple. I have a book here titled, Who Should I Marry? It's interesting that a lot of people really don't know the qualities to look out for in somebody they want to marry. As simple as that is, I watch one interview. They ask one lady, who do you want to marry? She said, I want the person to be tall, dark, 
I said, really? There are arm robbers that are tall, dark, and handsome. That's not, how, that's not how to look for who to marry. All these things are images and things they've painted in your mind. No. So I have a book here titled, Who Should I Marry? It has about 10 points. One of the first things you must look out for, please, let the person be in Christ. If you are a born-again Christian, please marry another born-again Christian. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know you might be saying, no, it doesn't matter. No, no, no. Look, look. You, you, you can't want to marry someone that is on their way to hell. It's unfair that you want to use them to fulfill. That I told you, you don't really love this person. You just want to fulfill your desire to be married. It's all about you. And you cannot marry someone that doesn't have the same spirit as you. A lot of the challenges adults are facing is tied to their upbringing. A lot of it. Look, in God's mind, you must understand this. Marriage is not about you. You are not the one that created marriage. It wasn't your idea. There was somebody behind the scenes creating marriage. And he made his intentions clear in the book of Malachi. He said one of the reasons he made marriage is to have godly seed. So God is not just interested in the board of you. He's interested in those kids. The kind of upbringing they have. I and my wife watched a video. Very horrific video of a 12 year old or something. 11 year old. Very sexual video. Because her parents had abandoned her. So she had, I don't, I don't know where she picked up that kind of sexual behavior from. And she was videoing it. And this girl you could tell she's heavily sexual active from 12. Heavily. And she was already trying to touch the daughter of the person she was living with. That was about five or six, seven or something. She was already trying to molest that one. Are you seeing what the devil is trying to achieve? You, you are trying to achieve marriage. The devil is thinking way beyond you. He's trying to see who he can destroy. So, so you can't partner with someone that is not on the same frequency with you. Spiritually, it's not just about sex and getting married. And not, no, God is looking for godly seed, and only godly parents usually can raise godly seeds. Somebody getting what I'm saying? God wants to preserve generations. He wants two parents. You can see the kind of story Pastor Kunle shared of their child, but two of them could stand together in faith. See when, see, see when they had they had the church of miscarriage, they could pray. That's what we are saying. But I think you might someone that is not born again. He, he, something is happening. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do. It took her and my wife eight years to have our first biological child. Eight years. And, and we did it by faith. We, we didn't shake. It didn't affect our marriage. We didn't start saying, I'm going to marry a second wife. But you know, there's, look, the values are different. So the person must be in Christ. That's the first C. The second C there is the character. Apart from the person being in Christ, what is their character? It's not everybody in church you can marry. Like I said in my video, I put on my page today. A church is a hospital. We have all kinds of people in churches. Every good church attracts prostitutes, attracts 419 fraudsters. Fake. If your church is good, if you, it's about attracting every kind of people. A church is a hospital. You don't know a good hospital by the doctors alone. You know the good hospital by the amount of patients coming in. A church is a hospital. So that's why it's not anybody you see in church that is okay. <laughs> Some are, we are still giving them treatment. Some are responding to treatment. Some are not responding <laughs> to treatment. They are not. So just because he's in church or he's a worker, you just say, I'll marry him. No. No, check their character. Which kind of person are they? What kind of person? How does, how, 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 does, how does he behave? How does he behave when he's not in church? All right? Check their character, their behavior. Does he lie? Does he steal? Is he the kind of person that doesn't really believe in the things we say in church? It's the argues about everything pastor says. Now watch out for that. Their character. The third C is companionship. This one is important. Please marry your friend. People make that mistake all the time. They just want to marry anybody they find. Marry your friend. Look, friendship, companionship is the major thing that marriage is made of. Are you here, somebody? I tell people, don't look for a wife and make the wife your friend. Look for amongst your friends and pick a wife. 
The person has to be your friend. Friendship is the main deal. Say, oh, pastor, people pretend so much. It's because you, you, everybody starts on the basis of marriage. If you really just be around somebody for, as their friend, it's easy for them to show you their true color. It's when you come with marriage, first week, you already say, I love you, I miss you. I, I, ah. So everybody starts acting drama. Just say, hey, we're friends. Let's go and do a platonic date. Let's just go and watch a movie. No, no love. Just go and watch a movie. You will see her behavior. You take her to a restaurant. Say, ah, order anything. And she just removes her belt. <laughs> That's the first thing she does. Just say, all these lists from this side, give me one each. <laughs> then you know that's not the way to go. <laughs> Are you here, somebody? Companionship. Hallelujah. So the person should be in Christ. Secondly, their character. Thirdly, is this person your friend? See, Single people, listen, in marriage, the bulk of your time will be spent just talking to your spouse. That's what we do. It's not sex. I know most of you think if I just marry like this, hmm, nobody should beg me on. They should not hold me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you will get tired. Mm, that's not all we do every day. Praise God. That's not all we do every day. How many hours are in one day? 24. If you have sex for one hour, how many hours are left? If you pray for one hour, how many hours are left? What will you be doing for 22 hours? If you guys are not friends. Oh, some marriages, they are not even friends at all. No conversation. Mama Bola, how are you? I'm fine. How is Bola? She's fine. How are us? I'm fine. Finish. No companionship. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because when all the high of I want to marry, I want to, the ones that has cleared out, what is left is friendship. Can you talk? Can you guys just hang out and talk? That's why, this is one of the reasons why you should even remove sex. Because sex, sex, you know, I have a message to seven sex lies. One of the sex lies Satan tells people is that sex helps intimacy. Before marriage, sex does not help intimacy. It actually crashes intimacy. You know why? Because when two people that are not married start having sex, every time you're planning to see, in your mind, you think that guy wants to see you. Say, hi, are we seeing today? He's saying yes. He's not thinking of you. He's thinking of sex. But if there's no sex, if you guys hang out and he, you guys can enjoy each other's company without sex, then you are likely to make it in marriage. But if sex is what is propelling the relationship, by the time you get, I've seen these things, you, you're having sex now. They say, don't have sex for marriage. You're having sex every day before marriage. By the time you get married, you have already finished the honey before the honeymoon. <laughs> you find that people like that get tired quickly of their spouse. On that sex life, people say, is that, ah, you need to build experience sexually. That if I keep myself, how will I have experience? Listen to me. Some of you now, you are PhD in sextology. You are gathering experience you don't need. The way God created it, whoever you marry, two of you will start building sexual compatibility from when you marry. And look, you have a long time. If you have been married for, you, don't, so you, you can marry for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. You, God is giving you enough time to learn about each other. But if you go and start before time, you have slept with 13 or 14 or 15 different people. You've gathered the experience of things you would never need. You now meet your spouse. They don't need all those things you've learned. You've gathered too much experience. You are a PhD. You now marry somebody that has OND <laughs> in sex. You are used to being, they, they spin you now. They spin you on the roof now. <laughs> on the fan. You now marry somebody that you cannot spin. And I say, honey, be spinning me. He said, I can't, I don't spin. I cannot spin somebody. <laughs> so you don't need the experience. Until you meet your spouse, you don't even know the experience you need. I don't know. And listen, gathering all those experience, when you have not met, you have not married the person, by the time you come there, you have built appetites for things that you can never be satisfied in your own marriage built appetite you can never be satisfied I've cancelled people that two of them don't want anything just want to have kiss and have sex they don't want to do any other thing and two of them are okay with it you see they will have peace because they are okay but you went imagine when one is PhD the other one is school sat live wayek 
And it sounds funny today, but I've seen couples that on their wedding nights, our wedding night, one of them is texting X that he's not like you. It's not like you. You it, experience. You want to gather too much experience. PhD, you marry OND. He now give you OND performance. You can never be happy. Many women come to me sometimes and say, Pastor, I'm not uh, satisfied sexually in my marriage. I say, compared to what? <laughs> compared to what? It's buffet, that's your problem. If this is the one and only you have ever eaten, you'll be happy. But you can't be happy now because you have, you have uh, gone too far. So don't listen to all those lies. Hallelujah. Hmm. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Ladies ask me all the time. I have a book here titled Seven Questions Wise Women Ask. I say, Lady, listen carefully. There are some questions you must be ready to ask. You must see, marriage is like an interview. You must be ready. You must be ready before the day. And these questions, you're not going to ask it as if it's an exam, but you, there are questions you must get answered. Anyhow, you want to get it answered, but you must confirm them on your list. Like I told you, one of the questions I addressed, like I said earlier on, is the question of who are, who are his mentors? Who are the people that I can talk to that are over your life? That when you are misbehaving, because I've seen, see, what happens when you marry is that you are given the steering wheel of your life. You are like entering a vehicle that on that man is driving. If there are no laws, if there are no terms and conditions, that guy can drive the whole family into the bush. And I've seen many families crash like that because the husband keeps making bad decisions. Nobody can talk to him. We just want to relocate. To where? Anywhere. Ah. Anyhow. No. There must be a proper plan. Have you prayed about it? Have you been counseled about it? Say, no. I'm the head of this home. It doesn't work like that. So, so, so ask him, who are the people that you respect? Who are the people that are your mentors that I can talk to? And check those people's marriages too. Men are pack animals. So they tend to behave like the people they work with. On that question, you must ask as a lady, if a guy wants to marry you, ask him when. Don't just agree to marriage without when. You say, I want to enter a relationship. Define the rela which type of relationship Ah, I've seen many ladies enter things that they can't, you, they call it situationships, not relationships. <laughs> Say, what's your relationship? We are just friends. We're... No, ask him, what do you mean? Say, I just want to see if you are the kind of girl that if it's possible, we can be close in, in, in a way <laughs> that possibly in a, in a feasible scenario. Ah, ah. He has said many things, but they, he hasn't defined it. He can stand up and disappear. <laughs> Define the relationship, then ask when. When do you want to marry? Because his timing might not. It's not everybody that wants to marry you that the timing works for you. And I'm telling ladies this because ladies' time is very sensitive for you. Time is sensitive for you. A guy can wait till 42 and marry the next day. For women, you can't let anybody waste your time. And I've seen a guy date a girl for about 10 years and not marry her. 10 years. I mean, PhD self doesn't take that long. After he left her, he started on that relationship that lasted again for about 10 years. Real life story. Somebody getting what I'm saying? That's why you can't just enter anything. A guy just keeps for five years after he says he's not doing it again. So no. For the guys, I have one here titled Seven Qualities Wise Men Want. Most men don't know the quality. The problem with men is that men, we, we, are, we fall in love first with our eyes. Women fall in love emotionally with their hearts. Men fall in love with their eyes. So they first see you before they even know you. They just see you, see your beauty, see your shape, and they're in love. And they say, I want to marry this girl. No. There are seven qualities wise men should want. One guy still contacted me last week. He said, Pastor, there's this girl. I like this. I like the girl so much, but she's very stubborn. She doesn't listen to anything I say. She doesn't do anything I say. I said, then what did you like about her? These are the things you should have checked. One of the qualities you should like in a lady is meekness. The Bible said the meek and quiet spirit is for, of, of the insight of the Lord of great price. So does she listen? 
is, does she have a mixed spirit? Is she subject to the spirit of God? Hallelujah. Does she listen? So there are qualities to look out for. Don't just jump into a relationship. Oh, she, I, I, I like her figure. Her figure won't mean anything to you when the real issues come. Do you like her as, uh, is, as is, does she have a sweet spirit? Because when you're marrying somebody, you're marrying both spirit, soul, and body. Not just body. Hallelujah. So in closing, I'll say this, guys. In closing, I'll say this. Marriage is such a spiritual thing. Most times when you're desperate to enter, it is because you don't understand what you're entering. It's something you must enter into solemnly. You must allow God to lead you. You must actually follow God's lead. And the honest truth is that if you are here and you're a child of God, God already has a plan for you. He didn't just create you and start wondering what am I going to do with you. No. There's already a plan and a path for your life to follow. And everything you are looking for is on that path if you can find it and follow it. So your, your concern is not even to look out for yourself. Your concern is to chase God. When you find God, you won't lack any other thing in your life. You won't lack any other thing. So now that you're young, is the best time to pursue God. God. God has got you covered. Adam did not find a wife. All Adam did was to sleep and God brought the wife. God will connect you. But follow him. There's a path laid out for the just. That path, all your things are in that path. You need to find it. It's a unique path for you. With your name on it. God has a plan. He, he, you, you are not an abandoned project. Are you here somebody? No, he has not abandoned you at all. All you need to do is to keep lining up with his will. And you will find purpose and find marriage and find fulfillment. Hallelujah. Line up with his will. Um, but let me just pray for you. Father, I pray for uh, the single people here trusting you for a life partner. Lord, I know that you're a miracle worker. You're a matchmaker. You already know who is best for us. Lord, the way you put Adam to sleep, give us the grace to sleep in you in the name of Jesus. Let's enter a place of rest. Let the desperation go. Let the fear and anxiety go in the name of Jesus. Let the peace of God reign in our hearts. And Lord, I pray for sensitivity. Let our steps be ordered. We'll be at the right place at the right time. We'll be seen by the right person. We will see the right person. I decree that our eyes will be open. We will become sensitive to your leading in the name of Jesus. If there are people in wrong relationships, Lord, we ask for deliverance. Lord, we ask for severance in the name of Jesus. Reconnect them to the right person. Lord, we pray for a quick walk for those that have waited on you for a while. Lord, we ask that this be their season of visitation in the name of Jesus. Thank you because the delay is broken. Nobody here will miss the mark in the mighty name of Jesus. And if there's any marriage here that is struggling, Lord, we ask for fresh wine. Let it flow in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. <laughs>